What's up, guys? It's Denise Salcedo. Welcome to our Wrestle Kingdom 15 post show review. Today, we're going to be recapping our favorite moments of the night, talking about all of the big things that happened at Wrestle Kingdom and so much more. But before we get into that, I want to introduce to you my co host for today, my very good friend, ESPN's very own combat sports reporter, Mark Ramondi. What's up, Mark? Hey, Denise. How's it going? It's good. It's good. I'm so excited to have you on. I feel like we've been wrestling friends for such a long time, but we've never actually done a show together or anything like this. That's true. I've seen you at wrestling shows. I've seen you at MMA shows. I've seen you all over. We're both LA residents, uh, so we kind of run into each other a lot. But uh, yeah, no, no show yet. This is the first one, so. Uh, well, you're hopefully. welcome for for, uh, for for having me on. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully the one of many. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the fact that we're both L.A. people because, Mark, I spot something right mm. behind your shoulder and I got to bring it up here really quickly. Yeah. My hair is going to like mess it up a little bit. Yeah. But check it out. Nice. Can you do the whole show with that on? Oh, Please. man, I'll do it for like 10 seconds, but there's dust flying down all over the place. I haven't dusted this since I got it. BTW, for those of you guys who are wondering what on earth these construction hats are, they're basically the ones that we were given at the WrestleMania 37 SoFi Stadium press conference, which, Mark, we were so happy. We were so excited. And then the world went to crap after that. I know. So, I mean, they're a collector's item because WrestleMania is, is definitely not happening at SoFi Stadium in 2021, right? That's a pretty much foregone conclusion. It really is. It's done. Yeah. We're done. Like, we were so happy, so excited, and it's not going to happen. But I guess we kind of got some normalcy here today when we had, well, this weekend when we had Wrestle Kingdom with actual living, breathing people in mm. the show, which was really nice. Uh, but before we get into that, we do have some comments here that I want to read really quickly. Uh, this uh -oh. one is from <laughs> Fightful Scraps Wrestling Interview Clips. I wonder who that can be. B says, Mark Ramondi, get off my turf. We don't like your MMA kind round here. What do you got to say to that, Mark? I'm not here to take part. I'm here to take over. <laughs> there we go, man. Hey, who says MMA reporters can talk about wrestling and wrestling reporters can talk about MMA? I mean, you could have easily kicked me out when I was out there covering Bellator. Look, I don't want to say anything, but in most cases, I've been watching wrestling much longer than some of these these young these young bucks. Not to not to uh, borrow a, a, a phrase there from the AEW tag team, but I've been watching wrestling for a very long time. I may be an MMA reporter, but wrestling was my first love, and I've been watching it since like 1990, I think, something like that. So, everyone, just slow your roll, slow your roll, fightful scraps. I'm here. So I think what you're saying, Mark, is you actually go where the money's at, right? Where the money's at. Wow. That's that's right. That's, That's right. awesome. Big bucks, Ray Mundy over here. That's me. Exactly. Hey, man, you got that ESPN money, so definitely the big bucks money. <laughs> uh, DJ Ryan Maker says DWO in the house. Colossal Razi kicking is off with his favorite match. Colossal Razi says, yo, Ibushi versus Jay White was a masterpiece. And uh, D-Train Riot Maker says it should be renamed Salcedo Stadium. And Fightful Scraps has a comeback, says... I don't believe in any MMA and wrestling crossover. Stay in your lane. Only cover one. Wow. Big words from big words from Fightful Scraps. And Mark Ramondi does not agree with this whatsoever. I, I, I feel like I feel like there you might be a little intimidated there. I think that you might be a little fearful that I'm coming onto your turf and I'm and I'm stepping up and I'm and I'm doing this thing with Denise, with your pal, of course. <laughs> That's think, awesome. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens, but don't be scared, homie. <laughs> Don't be scared, homie. That is the line of the day. So, Mark, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Wrestle Kingdom 15. And for those of you guys watching this live stream, please make sure to send in your thoughts, opinions, whatever it is. Send them in. Uh, we have a comment from some guy who says Osprey versus Okada went 35 minutes, but it felt like 15. So let's kick it off there, Mark. How did you feel overall about both nights of uh, night one and two of Wrestle Kingdom? I thought overall really, really good across the board. And it's been really a tough year. I know we're not in 2020 anymore, but it's really been a tough nine months to watch wrestling, especially American wrestling where it's either no crowd, a small crowd, a video crowd, 
canned noise. It, it's just been a really weird time to watch and enjoy wrestling. And I feel like, and I, and I don't think I'm alone in saying this, Denise, I think that a lot of people feel the same way, that it's 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 just hard to get into wrestling in the time of COVID-19 for so many reasons. And, and I, I really felt like these two nights of wrestling even though there were, it's not exactly the same as it was. It's not exactly 100% normal. It felt as close to normal, I think, as I felt watching wrestling since March. And and in that and in, in that way alone, I give it a big a, a big two thumbs up for the two Tokyo Dome shows because I just I just felt like it almost felt like I was, uh, you know, back pre COVID watching those shows. It felt almost like it was it was back to the way it was. I know it's not quite there, but. I, I I really enjoy both shows. No, I completely agree with you as well. I mean, having just like even even though it wasn't completely full the Tokyo Dome, we still knew that there was tons of people in there, and it really did feel new. And I know that in the beginning it was really hard when we were watching wrestling. You know, in the performance center, you're just hearing you know echoes. And I mean, thankfully now we have you know the inclusion of the Thunderdome and all of that type of stuff. But it is sometimes hard to get into it when you're not necessarily watching with a live crowd. So the fact that you know you were able to have that you know human interaction interaction that humans you know vibrance in there and even though they had certain restrictions it still just felt like such a massive deal so I 100% agree with you on that now in terms about the match quality like how did you feel about the matches that you saw from night one and night two extremely high which is which is kind of what you expect from from New Japan pro wrestling you you expect a very high quality of in-ring product and I think that they delivered for the most part, I, I don't think there was a single bad match. Uh, although the New Japan, you know, the New Japan Rumble, the Rambo, the Rambo. The Pro Wrestling Four Way on night two, not not the greatest things in the world. But you can't have a hundred percent serious matches the whole way through. It can't all be bangers. Um, but uh, it was it was great. I mean, it was uh, it was great. I stayed up for both. I'm very tired right now. I'm not really sure how I'm awake doing this, but I drank a lot of coffee. And I had you encouraging me throughout the day. You were giving me pep talks like you can do this. I you did. can mark. You can you can make it. And here I am, and I'm and I'm trying to do it. But uh, I thought both nights were good. I think I think I feel like night two was slightly better in some ways. But I think I think it was it was a really great two nights overall, and uh, and a great in ring product. Yeah, you know, when I was looking at the card for Wrestle Kingdom, I wasn't necessarily that crazy about it. I think that the matches that the matches that I was expecting to be good, they were perfect. They blew me out of the water and it became instant classics for the year. And I think that the matches that I wasn't necessarily crazy about ended up, you know, being a lot better than I expected or being exactly what I expected. So there wasn't necessarily a match that I thought, oh my God, this was bad. And that really wasn't. And I think that speaks to the testament of, you know, just the value and the type of matches that you know that you're going to get watching New Japan. And you mentioned, you know, staying up and watching late. I mean, you stay up and you watch late because you know the kind of quality matches that you're going to get you know going into this show yeah and 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 i and i mean so part of me does regret that a little bit because <laughs> I'm, I'm very sleepy and i have been for two days but uh, yeah i think that's what it's all about and i think for the most part when you know it's a new japan big show very rarely is a disappoint uh you know there 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 were some not i mean there were some questionable booking decisions in 2020 i feel like and there were some interesting different moves that that were that were made in new japan but i mean if you just uh, look back the last few years like uh, you can pretty much you know write in that if it's a big new japan pro wrestling show it's going to deliver and it's going to be a satisfying conclusion and it's not every time but for the nine out of ten times you're you're, you're pretty confident going in that it's going to be good and it's not going to disappoint you Exactly. All right. So let's go ahead and start off. I mean, we were talking about the Rambo night one. That's what we got the 20 man New Japan Ram Rambo. I look at the Rambo. The word's so hilarious. But what did you think of this match? What did you think of the outcome? And then we'll go ahead and talk about the results once we get to uh, night two for this. But what did you think about this match? <laughs> I didn't really think much of it, to be honest with you. There really wasn't much to uh, to write home about. Uh, the one thing is that I was very I mean, I was I was confused about why. They booked because so so the the Rambo the final four people in that match I, I hate calling it the Rambo it's the, it's it's the Rumble so the New Japan Rumble uh, there were four the four the four finalists were going to meet 
on night two in a four-way match for the King of Pro Wrestling title, which is kind of like a superfluous title. It doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Like it's your, here. Your it's version, open. New Japan's version of the 24-7 title. Uh, yeah, kind of. So, uh, I, I mean, it, I just didn't understand that the, the four finalists were Toru Yanu, <laughs> Bad Luck Fale, Chase Owens, and Bushi. And in that, in that rumble was Minoru Suzuki, Tomohiro Ishii, uh, uh, Togi Mata. I mean, there were, uh, there were a bunch of people that I, I felt could have uh, been in that four way. And I was, it was just, I thought it was a curious choice to choose the four guys that, that ended up making the four way on uh, night two. I have, I have a hard time with the Wrestle Kingdom without Tomohiro Ishii in a singles match or a, a prominent tag match. Same thing with Minoru Suzuki. So that was a little, that was a little bit weird to me, but that's what they ended up doing. And it was fine for what it does, what it was. But I mean, Ishii had an incredible year. I mean, I, Again, I mean, he's always one of the MVPs for New Japan every single year, and it just it it pains me greatly as an Ishii fan to see him not get rewarded with some kind of program at Wrestle Kingdom. It completely drives me nuts, and I completely agree with you. Like, I think like guys like the on top of the guys that you mentioned, you already mentioned uh, Suzuki. Uh, add Nagata in there. Add Hiroki Goto in there. I thought yeah. Toa was you know he's been really impressive. Add him, show like I think those are people yeah. that could have easily, you know, just been uh, better alternatives to this four way. And just you know, the fact that I agree with you one hundred percent. I would have rather seen Ishii in a singles match, Suzuki in a singles match, and if anything, my favorite part of the Ram- Rambo was actually the interactions that we had between Ishii and Suzuki. Although mm-hmm. brief, they were my favorite part of this match. One hundred percent, and and uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what why that was the case. I'm not really sure why they weren't chosen to be in a four way. Maybe, maybe guys like Ishii and Suzuki just don't work in that format of match because it was kind of, it was going to yeah. kind of skew and be more of a, a comedy match. But uh, I mean, that, that's, that's really that's, the only that's, exception. Yeah. But the thing is, is like, I would, I would say to counter that, I would say, well, why are those guys not in a program existing already? You know, why, why are they not in a, a prominent match at, at Wrestle Kingdom? And, and it was a lot, I mean, both cars were, were pretty loaded and, and, I can't really say like, oh, this guy shouldn't have been on there because I think everyone that was on those cards deserved it, and it was only six matches per card. But I don't know. It's just, it's just. I have a hard time. I have a hard time thinking that it's Wrestle Kingdom and there's no Ishii on my screen in a big match or a Suzuki in, in a big match, even a show. I think Show has done more than enough over the last few months and few years to earn a big spot, and hopefully that will happen in the future. But Ishii and Suzuki are, are older guys. You know, they should be. This is their time to, to be in these matches before you know they become they phase they they, they phase into the New Japan dad world of the <laughs> and the and the Nagatas. Yeah, exactly. And when you think back to the G one, I can almost I can almost guarantee that all your favorite matches probably included those names Suzuki and Ishii. You're like those are the guys that you know are really putting on the best quality matches. Uh, we have a comment here from Jobber JJ who says the Rambo finish was funny, such a Yano finish. We have a comment from Kevin Chu who says I want to see Ibushi defended for 13 times or maybe Sonata. D Train Riot Maker says Ishii, Ishii, Ishii. Nuff said. And Fightful Scrap says, I agree. I either wanted Suzuki, Goto, and Ishii to counter Yano's comedy or three Bullet Club guys and Yano. And uh, <laughs> and then we also have a comment here from Simone. Let's go ahead and read this one. Says, uh, Switchblade, Switchblade put on a 5.5 uh, star classic with Ibushi and then cut the greatest shoot kayfabe post-match promo ever. The rise of Jay White has been such a beautiful wrestling story of the past few years. Now, before we actually talk about the Jay White match, I do kind of want to talk about the fact that I feel that Jay White hasn't gotten the respect that he should be getting from the wrestling community. And this is really the first time where I actually feel people are finally putting some dang respect to the Jay White Switchblade name. Uh, do you agree with that, Mark Ramondi? I, I 100% agree with you. I thought I was going to have, have, have a big hot take and say that Jay White is great, but I guess not much of a hot take since you just... Not with me, because I've, I've always been a fan of Jay White, but I've seen people out there that they didn't see anything in him. I'm like, are you guys nuts? Like, what are you not seeing? I, I am willing to, and I know this is probably a hot take, but I think that in ring... Jay White is the best heel in professional wrestling right now. I think that his in-ring performances as a heel, I think he is the best right now. I think there are better heels on the mic. I think MJF is a tremendous heel. But if you're talking about just in the ring and what he does and, and his and his psychology and and everything kind of 
everything kind of fits in its place and just what he says. And I mean, everything that he does, I mean, his, his mannerisms, his expressions, uh, to me, he's the best heel in terms of the in-ring in, in pro wrestling right now. And, and that, and that promo that, that I think Simeon or whatever the comments or his name was. Yes, really Simeon. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that was an incredible promo. Like one of the best promos, it'll probably be one of the best promos of the year. Uh, you know, in, in 12, in 11 months, when, when 2021 comes to a close, that was an incredible promo in, in the post fight press conference, uh, you know, in, in Japan after the show, just tremendous stuff. And, and Jay White, he's 28 years old. I mean, this guy is going to be around for a long time. We're going to be talking about him in 10 years being probably one of the greatest to ever, to ever do it. I really, I really do feel that way. Yeah. And I'm so happy that you mentioned like the mannerisms and it's really the little things that he does in the ring that I completely agree with you on. And even that post-match promo, I mean, the part where he knocks himself down from the chair to the ground, dang, that popped me so hard. I, I just thought it was brilliant. I was like, the guy was so upset. He fell to the ground. He's pissed off. I loved that. And then at the end when he's hollering, yelling at, you know, somebody to come help him. I mean, I thought all of that stuff was brilliant. And Honestly, it's something that we rarely get to see. I mean, there's people, you know, across different promotions that are able to pull off those kind of promos. But I really do think that Jay White is, you know, he's up there. Uh, some guy says Jay White is such a commodity. And yeah, and we'll definitely go ahead and talk about that more once we get into this match. But let's talk about the opening match uh, to night one, which was Hiromo Takahashi versus El Fantasmo. Uh, what what did you think about this match? I thought it was solid. It was, it was, there were some really fun spots wasn't the greatest match at the you know i would give it like a you know like a c plus b minus type of deal but i think it served its purpose and it got hiromu into the title match with ishimori on night two and i think it also left open the door for a rematch between the two of them which i think i think both of them are capable of having a better match but i think that in the opener of night one they weren't going to go all out and and you know try to have a five-star match but i think those guys are capable of having a really good match together yeah, you know, I actually thought this was a fantastic opening and I was I already was rooting for Hiromo to win because I did want to see that match for night two. So it didn't matter that I was already going in for him winning. But I just love the fact that in Fantasma, I thought he looked fantastic. I mean, he was doing some stuff in the ring that I thought looked so crisp, so clear. There was a moment where he did like this beautiful sunset bomb and it was in what I liked about it was that it was fast and in slow motion at the same time. <laughs> I don't know why that makes any sense to me at all, but it really does. And there was a moment also too where he did like this great moonsault that just looked so high so far. I loved it. There were a lot of things that I loved about this match. And I really thought that it was a fun opening match. And this was probably the best way to kick off the show. I have a question for you, Denise. Yes. What is Turn it? The tables. Turn the tables. I believe it was Rocky Romero on commentary during that match who said that El Fantasma reminds him of Sean Waltman, your, yeah. your pal, X-Pac. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think of that? Do you agree? I completely. Okay. So when he said that, at first I misunderstood him and I thought he said Hiromo. And I was like, oh, okay, that's really interesting. <laughs> and then afterwards I went back and no, he did say El Fantasma. So, mm -hmm. I, so I liked that because once I – and once I realized that he wasn't saying it about Hiromo and that he wasn't saying it about Fantasmo, I thought that it made a lot of sense in this in the way that he was talking about, like just the way that he executes certain moves and the type of agility that he brings and the type of speed that he does. I 100 percent see it. And I liked that. I liked that. You know, uh, I like the fact that he did that comparison. I thought it was really great. Yeah, I never I never really considered that before but after he said it i could definitely see it and to me that's a huge compliment because i think sean waltman was extremely underrated for his in-ring work when he was when he was in his prime because it really wasn't i feel like sean waltman if he was in his prime right now he would be like the, one of the biggest deals in professional wrestling because when he was in his prime it wasn't really a the, the work the, the product was not really a big work rate product the attitude era and now the guys are his size. He's actually bigger than some of these guys, and he can do everything those yeah. guys can do. I think that if if I mean, he was kind of ahead of his time in many ways. He was 100% ahead of his time. Like, he was doing things at that moment that, you know, looking back now, you're like, oh, a bunch of these guys are doing right. it now. But back then, that wasn't necessarily the case. And, you know, there was so many, like, you know, do working in the show with Sean, I went back and watched so many of his matches. And I couldn't believe, like, just having that refresher and, like, even seeing some stuff that I hadn't seen before from his early, early, early years. It was really interesting just to see the sort of level in which that he was, in which that he was at 
at. So I do like that comparison a lot. Colossal Rousey says El Fantasmo is super underrated. And I really do. I I think that to I think if anything, tonight's show was just a hey, like look at me. I'm somebody to watch. And I and I hope, I hope, I don't know what the plans are, but I hope he's gonna stay in Japan now and and be on the next few tours because I think that was an issue, right? He was on he did he did a few shows in the US, the New Japan strong, but he really hasn't been in Japan. He he wasn't he wasn't in the best of the Super Juniors that Hiromu won. He was doing a Super J Cup in the US. So hopefully he stays in Japan and you know maybe him and Ishimori they get together and they form their reform their tag team, which I thought was really entertaining in twenty nineteen. That that Bullet Club junior tag team thought they were really good. Uh, so maybe uh yeah, I, I hope to see bigger things from him for sure in the future. Yeah, 100 percent agree. Uh, moving on to the second match, which was for the IWGP IWGP Tag Team Championships. And we had Zack Sabre Jr. and Tai Chi, which I may add, that's a really, really uh, interesting tag team. And uh, Gorillas of Destiny. Uh, let's start off with this one. What did you think of this match here? I actually really liked this match. It was better than I thought it was going to be. I didn't have a ton of high expectations for it, but Zack and Tai Chi have been such a good tag team this year. And and honestly, like New Japan. For the last like four years, tag team wrestling has not been a big priority. And I wouldn't say that it is now, but it seems like it's a better division and at least a division that is putting, there's a little bit more care being put into it than there was in previous years. And I love the Zach Tai Chi tag team. I'm okay with Grills of Destiny going over that match, even though I kind of wanted Dangerous Techers to win, but I can kind of see both those guys doing some single stuff here in the future with these tours coming up. But yeah, I mean, I, I want, I want that to continue. I really want, I really want the, the, the new Japan to focus more on their, on his tag teams because they have some talent there and there's no reason why you can't put guys like Ishii and Goto together. Right. That's a, that's a good example. We were talking better about off than putting them in the Rambo. <laughs> yeah. You know, these guys in the Rambo, like why, why isn't that team going for the tag team titles? Even, even Goto and Yoshihashi, in 2020 had some really strong matches together in, in the six man, the never six man division and also on the tag team division. I mean, I, I think that uh, a more focus on that in the future would be, would be a really good idea. I thought this match was solid. Didn't love the ending too much, you know, the typical bullet club shenanigans, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here for a, a more important consequential new Japan heavyweight tag team division in 2021. Right. So, you know, I love that you said all that and I do have, have to add that I didn't necessarily like this match in the beginning. I didn't really, I thought it was, it got off to a really slow start. And to yeah. be honest, I thought that what made this match good and it did get really good towards the end was really Zack Sabre Jr. Because I just kind of didn't feel like Tai Chi was really doing his, uh, his best part in terms of playing the babyface role, the babyface in peril, you know, looking for that hot tag. I didn't really feel like that came along, that came across strongly. So it almost felt like two heel tag teams. So for that, for me, like there could have been some, you know, alterations in that sense. But I do think that how this match ended up being, uh, it really ended up being this really nice, you know, uh aggressive match but i do have to say that i think that the person who really made me like this match so much more was zach saber jr because he was the one in my opinion who really brought forth all of this energy into this match totally agree and and i i, I mean tai chi just can't he can't be a baby face i mean he's just it's just not it's just not a thing i just can't picture that man's baby face uh <laughs> sleazy douchebag like you know Phantom of the Opera wannabe singer, uh, so I can't. I can't. I mean, so I mean, I, I do agree. Two it, on paper going in, I th I felt the same way. Like uh, two heel tag teams. Like who who are we rooting for here? And I think that Zach and Taichi, they obviously they were they were playing the babyface and maybe didn't come across a hundred percent initially. But Zach's fire did take over. He's one of the most underrated wrestlers in the world. No, seriously. And I think that probably the, I don't know, maybe the reason for that is just because his style is so different and maybe not everybody, you know, gravitates towards mm -hmm. that style. But I feel like because he is the best of the very best doing that style, it's almost like it's hard not to be fa a fan of his. We do have a comment from Jabber JJ who says, Tai Chi has grown on me. Zack Sabre Jr. is just as great. Nice to see G.O.D. winning at the big show. And Kalaza Razi has a dream booking scenario, says one day we need to see uh girls of destiny versus the usos can you imagine that that'd be a lot of fun that'd be a lot of fun and and i do agree with that last comment tai chi has come a long way in the last few years because i mean a few years ago when he was a junior i mean he was uh, almost actively trying to have bad matches and now 
I thought he had a really fun G1. I, I enjoyed a lot of his matches with Zach in 2020 in the tag division. I, I, I'm, a, I'm actually a fan of Tai Chi now. I never thought I would see that. Like, if you had in 2017, I would be like, are you kidding me? This guy's terrible. But now I actually really enjoy him. Yeah, you know, for, for me, it always ha you know, it's weird, like, when it just goes across like any company, any promotion, like whenever I decide that I'm like, I'm not a fan of this person, usually for the most part, I never really change my opinion. But I feel that that always happens to me, like whenever in New Japan, like whenever I don't like necessarily, I'm not crazy about someone like I'm just, I'm just there, I'm just a fan, I'm just whatever. But I feel like that's usually the place where I'm usually convinced that I end up liking somebody a lot more than if I were watching, I don't know, just somebody else that I don't know why that always happens to me uh but let's go ahead and talk about the third match of the night uh for the main card which was for the iwgp us heavyweight uh right to challenge we had kojima versus kenta uh how did you feel about this one seeing it on paper is one thing and then seeing it on the actual you know the actual night of i thought it was a really it was a solid match and you know kojima is is in his 50s so i mean you can't really expect him to have a uh you know a five-star classic at this point in his career but he's still good enough to get a really good match out of him in a big spot which he did here that was not supposed to be the match it was supposed to be kenta versus juice but of course juice got injured so they had to fill you know kojima into that role and i thought it was really good i mean it was solid for i don't want to say it was really good but it was solid for what it was and it's another defense of the u.s title briefcase for kenta and hopefully this John Moxley match happens at some point in the future, whether it's in Japan or the U.S. or, you know, on an, on an island somewhere, on a boat. I mean, anywhere. Just do this match. Ken just had that briefcase forever. Give that man the title already, you know. Have, have that match happen. Seriously. And honestly, though, had this match happened 10 years ago, I mean, this would have been a marquee match. You know, Kenta being a top star for Noah, Kojima's top star for All Japan. You know, they've had limited interactions throughout their career. So definitely just like the timing of this is different. But I do have to say that for what it was, I thought it was a perfectly fine match. It wasn't anything where I was like, oh, my God, this is horrible or anything like that. Uh, so I liked it. But I do agree that, you know, I do have to say that Kenta necessarily hasn't recovered completely since his WWE run. And that's been very unfortunately because I just don't think he's anywhere near to what he used to be. Yeah. And, 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 and you know what he, the age, the injury factor, the wear and tear, I don't know if he'll ever fully, I mean, it's actually almost impossible to fault him for not being the same guy that was in Noah because that guy was just incredible. I mean, he was one of the best pound for pound rushes on the planet in, in those years, like in the mid, in the mid aughts, you know, early, early 2010s even. Uh, but I've, I've appreciated his run in new Japan as a heel, especially when they turned him heel after the G one in, in 20, it was 2019. Right. Uh, so I, I think uh, I really like what they've done with him. And uh, now I, I don't know where he goes from here. I mean, I guess it's a, it's, it's John Moxley, but where's that match going to take place? Is Moxley going to yeah. find a way to go to Japan? Is it going to be in the States? I mean, Kenda still lives in Florida, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure how they're going to pull that one off. I mean, can Moxley even wrestle in the United States with his AAW contract? I don't know the answer to these questions. So it seems like that division, which, you know, starting the year had a lot of promise. It was Moxley. Moxley was like in the new beginning tour. He did that tag match with Okada. He wrestled Suzuki in like just a incredibly fun match. And now it seems like that division is kind of, uh, you know, in, in a weird spot in, you know, there was a time where I, I feel like New Japan had too many belts, but now there's no, you know, there's no intercontinental champion. There's just a double champion at the top. So now it's almost like, well, they don't have enough. I don't, I don't think they have too little belts, but it just seems like the divisions are not moving the way that they were. Right. And we do have a super chat from uh, Jobber JJ. First of all, thank you so much for sending in a super chat. This is very greatly appreciated. Jobber JJ says, Wrestle Kingdom was great, amazing wrestling, and hardly any interference. Okada versus Osprey felt like a different style of a match. Cobb versus Shingo is my type of match. Ibushi is my spirit animal. Uh, first of all, I got to say that Okada versus Osprey was my number one favorite match of both nights. And I know we'll talk about that that one but it was really great it was it was freaking incredible yeah i mean i i could definitely see that being the top match of of the two nights i mean it's it's a match of the year contender it was just it was just superb and i mean okada it's like okada at the dome you could really put anybody in there. you could put denise you can go wrestle okada next year at the dome in 2021 2022 oh, like, you look like a star 
And it would be a four star match. I mean, that guy is just four it, star. Dome. Mark, come on! I want to break the scale. Give me like a, seven, a, seven a and half stars. stars. Thank you. I'll oh, take well. that. I'll take Big, Big that. Dave, where, where are you at? <laughs> Okay. So like, seriously though, I agree with you in that sense. Like Okada is, he's that guy that like, it reminds you like, Hey, like you thought that if you thought my days were numbered, bro, they ain't, we just getting started here. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about this next match because this next match, I don't think I know anybody that was really excited for this match. And it was uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi versus the great Okan. What did you think when they announced this match? And then afterwards, what you saw? Did your opinions change at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I understand the, the necessity and the utility of this match. But I felt like Tanahashi... I feel like the story they were telling with Tanahashi all year was that he's kind of like washed up and he's not the same guy as he was. And, you know, in, in reality, there is some truth to that. But I also felt like he had a tremendous G1. And I felt like he actually looked healthier in the G1 than he had in a little bit. Maybe it was that break during their, their COVID hiatus that he was actually able to rest. But I thought he actually had a pretty good year, Tanahashi. And, uh, you know, you always hope for a guy like Tanahashi to have a, a big match you know, a main event or a semi-main event at the Dome every year. It's, it's Hiroshi Tanahashi, even though he's in his, you know, mid-40s now. Uh, so the Great Okan matchup was a little bit underwhelming when I saw it. It reminded me a little bit of when Tanahashi faced Switchblade, Jay White, in his in his return from excursion a few years ago at the Dome. It reminded me a little bit of that. And the match itself was not bad. In fact, I think it was actually the best Okan has looked since coming back from excursion. When he was a young lion, I was I was a fan of him. I thought I thought he was going to be pretty good as a as a as a you know a full time wrestler when he came back from excursion. And I thought this match was pretty good. I, I b before this match, I had I had some doubts about Okan, but I think that obviously you know facing Tanahashi is going to make you better. But I think it was it was really good for him to get that match. I thought he looked good. I thought he looked pretty strong in that match, even though he lost. I thought he looked like he had a better offensive move set than he had shown previously. So all in all, I don't think it was a complete. It was a complete loss. I, I didn't think it was a bad match. I didn't think it was a great match. It was somewhere in between, and I think that it was kind of a positive note for Okan moving forward. You know, I feel like you're, we're a lot more hopeful maybe than I was on this one because when I saw this, I had zero interest. I was like, oh, God, like we could be seeing Hiroshi Tanahashi versus really, you know, mm -hmm. anybody else. But I think the fact that this match was tolerable and it wasn't, you know, like you said, it wasn't awful. And I think really a lot of that credit obviously has to go to Hiroshi Tanahashi on that one. I just feel like there's zero uh, believability when it comes to the great Okan's character. And he's had about two years since he's been working on that character when they sent him to the UK for excursion. So the fact that that still isn't really sticking for me, it's just, it's a hard pass for this one for me to get, you know, honestly invested. Yeah, no, I, I, to I totally get that. I, I feel like he is trying to adapt a little bit. Like he's already made some Changes to the in-ring gear. Uh, I do kind of like the entrance gear. It's a little, it's a little wacky. It's a little bit cartoony, but I kind of do dig it. But uh, I think he's talented, and I, I really think so. So the real life Tomoyuki Oka, the, the guy who who plays Great Okan on TV, is actually a legitimately good uh, shooter. Like he can actually, he can actually fight for real. He's a sambo guy. I actually, I actually know a guy he trained in sambo with. It's a guy that I know really? from New York who trained in sambo with him. And he's actually a really uh, decorated. I don't want to say decorated, but he's he's definitely a a, a solid shooter. Like he had he has a, a background in legit martial arts and sambo MMA. And I'd like to see him lean into that a little bit more than the stuff that he's doing in the ring now. He showed a little bit of that against Tanahashi, more suplexes. But I think if he adapts his game in that way and becomes a little bit more of that of that shoot style, a little bit more strong style. I think he could fit in the, in the never division, in the never open weight division. I think he could be a so good like fit in that, that moving forward. Yeah, I like that. I like that. We have a super chat from Matthew Makovsky. Thank you so much to Matthew. He says, <laughs> what's the difference between four and five stars? Question mark. Mark, do you have an answer for that? I would think you would have to ask Dave that. What's the difference between the four and the five stars? Are you frozen? Did I lose you? I think you're back. Oh. Now. Oh, okay. You're back. You're back. I was yeah. like, I was like, what happened to Mark? No. <laughs> uh, the no, difference I between four and five stars. Yes, go for it. Do you have an answer? Yeah, one star. That's the difference. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, it's okay. Never mind. My bad. I was like, I think you would have to ask Dave on that one. See, uh, what do you call it? Matthew Makowski says, JK, LOL. It's a Dave Meltzer joke. <laughs> I love that. Uh, thank you so much to Matthew Makowski for the awesome uh, super chat and giving us a little, sm bringing a little smile here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, BTW, Matthew Makowski says, I was late. Can I get a quick understanding on who <laughs> Mark is? Mark, introduce yourself to the people. <laughs> uh, I don't have a very good answer for you. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out myself, you know, who I am. And I'm trying to do some deep thinking and soul searching. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're, we're live. Uh, yeah. So uh, I am I, I am a combat sports reporter for ESPN. Uh, I've been doing that for almost two years now at ESPN. And uh, before that, I was the deputy managing editor at MMAfighting.com, which is uh, one of the premier MMA sites in, in the world. And uh, I've been a wrestling fan for pretty much my entire life and a, a big fan of Japanese pro wrestling for the last, you know, several years. Um, I mean, I, I first discovered it probably like in the, in the mid, in the mid aughts. And, uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. That's all, that's all I got for you, Matthew Mikowski. If you want to find out more, you can do another super chat and, uh, you know, put more, <laughs> For more uh, simoleons in Denise's pocket, and and here's the thing, and you're good friends with Denise. I, love, I like long, I like walks on the beach, and you know, <laughs> pina coladas and whatever. I don't know. That's all I got. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, thank you to Matthew Makovsky for asking the hard kidding questions. I love okay. this. Uh, seriously though, that's awesome. But I do have to say, I think you're not putting yourself over enough for all of the work that you do, you know, in MMA. I, you need to definitely leading that, leading that area there, Mark, you need to, you need to put yourself over more. Can I hire you as my, uh, as my on-screen, uh, Paul ballet Hayman? manager, my Paul I'll Heyman. Be your, I'll be your Don Callis. Let's do this. Yeah. Can you please be my on-air advocate? I can really use an advocate. I'm very bad at putting myself over. <laughs> seriously that's how I was that's how I told you I was like take the floor put yourself over man you deserve it uh here we go <laughs> uh this match of the night we had uh oh my god what I was just saying was my favorite match of the night which Kazuchika Okada versus Will Osprey Mark Ramondi please tell me you love this match as much as I did so I'll be honest with you Denise so on on night one of Wrestle Kingdom there was the intermission after Kenta and Kojima and it was very late at that point. It was probably after 2 a.m. Pacific, right? Something like that. And uh, I was I was dragging big time. I'm not going to lie to you. And then and then Tanahashi and Great Okan happened. And again, it was not a bad match, but it's not what you're trying to three in the morning. It's, you know, or almost three in the morning. It's like I, I, was, I was really in need of something to bring me back to life. And that was Okada versus Osprey. That match was absolutely phenomenal from the very bell the very first bell i i thought that match was a masterpiece i i it, i mean i i have to you know let it marinate a little bit longer but it may have been the best match over the, over the last uh you know the two nights but at that moment i was like man this was an incredible five-star type match shout out to dave Meltzer, my my buddy my guy uh i i don't know what else to say about about okada I mentioned it earlier i think i think he's one of the greatest of all time i i think that what he's been able to do at age 32, I think he's 32. I mean, he's not even in his prime of, you know, when a wrestler really starts to figure out uh, how, to, how to do this damn thing. And and Osprey, the way that he's evolved his his style over the last, you know, year, year plus, where he's put on weight, he's put on muscle, he's not doing some of the acrobatics that he that he did before. He's not right. using that junior style. He, he is adapted, excuse me getting emotional uh he's adapted yeah. to the new japan heavyweight main event style of wrestling it's hard hitting uh you know his 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 spinning his his disc his forearms his i mean his kicks i mean his chops everything is so much crisper stronger if you go back and watch the matches with like a rick like ricochet the matches that a lot of people kind of uh gravitated to years ago it's like watching a completely different human being and uh, I got a message uh, after that match. I'm not going to mention who it was from, but it's from someone in, in MMA who, who, who deals a lot in, in mixed martial arts, who's at a lot of big UFC fights from the UK. Uh, and this person texted me saying, Will Osprey is one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen in person, uh, 
being from the UK, you know, going to see his matches in the UK. And this is a guy that, you know, is cage side for like Habib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor and John Jones. And he said, Will Ospreay is one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen in person. So that was, to me, that was a big endorsement of Will Ospreay and, and who he is and, and what he's been able to do. And, and that match again was just, I thought it was sensational. Yeah. And you know, I'm so happy by the way that you were talking about the differences in between of how, you know, Will Ospreay was wrestling at the start and where he's at now. And that was one of the things that I wrote down in my notes that was very noticeable during this match is that again, he wasn't where I think, you know, back then or like, you know, in the past, he's been known as the guy that, oh, he's going to come out. It's going to be like a spot fest. He's just going to be flying around the mm -hmm. ring doing all of this stuff. But I really think that this match ended up showing just how versatile he actually is and the different styles that he can work with, you know, depending on the, the caliber of the match, the opponent that he's in, you know, what the story of the match is. You really start to see that versatility in Will Ospreay. And I have to say that I really do believe that he cemented himself as one of those guys that you know is in line is you know is somebody like a naito is somebody like an okada you know just in that really that realm of those guys and i'm so happy that you were one of those people that you know, that noticed that and mentioned that too because i felt if anything this match was very very obvious in that sense where you've seen this growth of will osprey and in terms of okada like i said earlier okada really just said hey guys like i'm freaking okada like okadas they don't grow on trees like we're out here like he went out there had an awesome match and i think my favorite thing about this whole match was that they did a lot of stuff that created a lot of suspense leading up to those very high speed moments. It kind of had like different tempos throughout this match where they were, you know, slower at some points and then they would just go into this insane speed. But everything that they did prior to that was really just building up that moment. And it kept me engaged because I thought at any moment, these two guys are going to snap and they're just going to go like balls to the wall, you know, crazy or whatever. And so that I think is what kept me as a viewer invested in this match yeah i think people um and and one of the things that fascinates me most about professional wrestling is the layout of matches and and just how just how the hell they do that i mean it's like to me i mean that's like the 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 mystery and the wonder of wrestling right is like how the hell do you have a 40 minute match with another person and have it be flawless and beautiful and tell a story and be hard hitting and and you know get all get to all your spots and 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 always you know be in the right place at the right time and and when you watch an Okada match it's like he all of those things but it's almost like watching a great musical performance when I watch Okada because you you mentioned the rhythm and there yeah. is a there is a unique cadence to Okada's matches where he there there is a there is a pace that he keeps and then the exciting moments kind of happen in like the off beats, right? You know what I mean? Like he, like he, like it's a, it's a, it's the same pace, same pace, same pace. And then all of a sudden something changes to make the pace either speed up or slow. And that's kind of the beauty of Okada's matches. It's almost like the, just the cadence and the rhythm. And, and he's, he's just a, he's an artist. I mean, it's really tremendous and he does it with everyone. And of course, like the higher level guys like a Naito and a uh, you know, a Jay White, Will Ospreay, he can have, flawless matches with them five stars and up you know kenny omega obviously but this match was was really great i love the storytelling i love you know osprey using the rainmaker and then waking up okada who had not used the rainmaker pretty much all year you know since covid he had not used the rainmaker and of course that's what he used to get it done he, he knew he needed to get that he knew he needed to hit the rainmaker to beat osprey because he couldn't do it without it you know, one of my favorite parts was when Okada was just kicking him in the head and telling him to stand up and to get up. That was actually one of my favorite parts in terms of like the storytelling aspect, because it was really kind of like a, hey, like you think you're at my level? Nah, you're not. And that was him essentially, you know, saying that. And then afterwards, we did get to see that revenge, that turning point when Osprey, I believe he just like starts like slapping him like uncontrollably stomping him. I mean, it was just a bunch of little things that they did in this match. Uh, there was a quote that I wrote down from Rocky Romero where he said, I can't deal with this kind of drama. My heart can't take it. And I really thought that was a great way to sort of uh, close out this match here. Yeah, and, and I and I love the finish too. I really thought going in that Osprey was going to win because it makes sense. Right? He just turned heel. He turned on Okada. He now leads his own faction. So it stood to reason like, okay, he's going to come in and he's going to go over Okada and he's going to have a big 2021 now leading the empire. 
but it wasn't that way at all. It was Okada, you know, kind of holding serve at the dome like he always does. And and when I think about it, that actually makes a lot of sense. Osprey is still in his twenties. He is not at Okada's level yet, and no one, and I don't think anyone thinks that he is. There is still time for him, but I still think he's going to have a big 2021. Don't get me wrong. I think he, he could probably win the New Japan Cup. I can see that happening. I can see him having a really big match at Dominion, if not even you know challenging for the title at some point against Ibushi. But, uh, I mean, that guy, is, the sky is the limit. I mean, I think, you know, we talked about Jay White a few minutes ago in 10 years being considered one of the best ever. Osprey's even younger than him. And Osprey is already at a level that, I mean, he, it's just, it's unfair how good he is at, at that age. It's just, uh, it's, it's ridiculous. It's wild. Uh, we, by the way, Mark, I have some good news for you here. It looks like you might be getting a five-star rating from this podcast because we have some very favorable comments. So I'm going to go ahead and read a few of them. Matthew McCoskey says, I petitioned for huh. Denise to have Mark on more often. Seems like fun to listen to. <laughs> You're going to have to get Matthew. that clearance from ESPN more. Approve me for all Denise shows. Um, <laughs> Abhiv Nav says, Mark Romandi is very good. You're See? a smart man. Smart <laughs> man. You're definitely, yes, you're definitely getting the love here. Uh, Zane Miller's, uh, oh, wait, Jobber says Empire went 0 3. Yeah, they did. Sure. And uh, I wanted to read a comment here from Zane Miller. Okay, here we go. Zane Miller says Okada is truly the best, and I'm so glad he used the Rainmaker. Yep. 100% agree to. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk about the final match from night one. And it was uh, the main event, uh, Tatsuya Naito versus Kota Ibushi. This was definitely one of the best matches of the night. I mean, you know, we talked about the Okada Osprey match feeling like some sort of musical concert or whatever you want to call it. This to me felt like a journey. This to me felt like a movie. There was so much that happened, so much that these two guys did in this match. Um, I loved it. What did you think of it? Whenever Naito and Ibushi wrestle each other, it I, I kind of like hold my breath because they seem to have a a desire and a will to try to break each other's necks. And then I don't Kill say that. Other, like, yes. <laughs> really. So the, their, to me, their best match was at MSG. It was at Square Garden back in 2019. And I, that was a tremendous match. And then they had a match that same year at Dominion. And that match like went overboard. Like it was a great match, but there were so many head drops and, and neck bumps in that match. There was that, that insane apron you know, spot that Ibushi, you know, caught his head and cut his head in the apron on the suplex from Naito. Just dangerous stuff. And they did some dangerous stuff in this match too, but it wasn't to that level. And that's a good thing. I thought there was more, there was more, more of a method to their madness in this match. I don't think it was as good as that MSG match from a couple of years ago, but I thought it was still very, very good. I thought everything made sense. I thought that they, they, they sold at least in between those ridiculous head drops. But I mean, even, even like, I mean, there was one. There was one spot where Ibushi clotheslined Naito on the on the apron. Right, it's a, it's a normal spot that happens all the time. And Naito just decided, I'm just gonna bump my neck for this for this spot. It's just a clothesline on the apron. It's just I don't I don't know what these they they bring out the worst in each other, but also the best in each other. If that makes any sense. I it yeah. Was a very good match, and obviously, the ending was so good with with Naito, you know, t- taking the belts back and almost looking like he was upset that he lost and he wasn't going to give Ibushi his moment, but then handing off the belts to Ibushi with, with both hands. That was a beautiful moment and uh, kind of established Naito as a kinder, gentler Tetsuya Naito than he was maybe, you know, four years ago when he was pretty much a full on heel. Everyone loved him for being a heel, but now he's very much a, you know, he's very much a full on baby face. And that kind of cemented that to me, that that's the story that they were telling. Yeah. And I think for me, so I had hoped that could I I I would. Oh, am I frozen? Can you can you see me? My back? Are you seeing me? Yeah, I see you. I was like, am I back? I'm gone. (laughs) All right. I was like, well, this is not good. I was like, if I disappear, I don't know what's gonna happen. (laughs) I'll just take Um, over. I'll just start talking. Yeah, people will be like, forget Denise, screw her. We like Mark Ramondi, <laughs> she out, he in, whatever, being replaced. Um, no, but seriously, though, what I loved about this match is, okay, so I went in expecting Kota Ibushi to win, wanting yeah. him to win, but, I, you know, obviously it's not a for sure thing. So I got to say, I actually popped for this match when Kota Ibushi won. I liked, you know, the near falls that led up to his victory. My favorite spot was when they were both uh, on the, the ring side and uh, the edge of the ring. And basically, Kota did that hurricanrana, like, to the outside. 
That looked fantastic, man. That was such a good spot. Both of the parts where they were both just punching each other back and forth. And I know we see that a lot in New Japan, but either even so, that always like elevates the match that much more for me. Just that one simple, you know, combination. So I liked all of this stuff. And I did love everything, the post-match, you know, with Jay White coming out. I loved the, you know, the tension between them. And also Ibushi is that person where he doesn't have to say much, but he says a lot with his facial expressions. Mm -hmm. And that also, uh, it's really good. Yeah, I feel like Ibushi, when it comes to his mic work, it's kind of less is more is best. I think he, he can do he can do enough without actually having a, you know, a long promo, like a, like a Jay White or someone like that, or even like a, a Tanahashi or a Naito. But, uh, it, you know, he's the man now, and he's going to have to close those shows, you know, moving forward with, with promos. So it's going to be something he has to, you know, work on. And look, I don't speak Japanese. I don't even know what he's saying. But I think <laughs> I think that you have, even, even if you don't speak Japanese, you kind of know who's a good promo and who's not. Oh, um, yeah. You watch the backstage, you know, the, the, the press conferences and, that, and the, the backstage comments. You know, like, you know, like Suzuki is a tremendous promo. I don't know what he's saying, but uh, he scared the crap out of you. You don't I mean, I have no idea what he's saying, but it's 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 terrifying. He's obviously very charismatic. And the same thing for a Tanahashi. Um, so that's fine. And, and Ibushi, he doesn't he doesn't need to be the best guy on the mic because he has so many other things. I mean, he's just uh, one of the best baby faces. We're not right worthy now. of Ibushi. What was that? I was like, we're not worthy of Ibushi. <laughs> No, I mean, how is that guy even a real human being? I mean, how is that man real? I mean, he's like 38 years old. He looks like he's carved out of stone. He looks like a freaking Greek god in there. I mean, it's ridiculous. He has like 25 abs. Uh, yeah. you know, he does the, he can do the most ridiculous things. He can get dropped on his neck and come back like it's no problem. And uh, he he's just a, a, a wild human being who pro I don't think he has any, I don't think he like he's in touch at all with reality, like outside of, Pro wrestling, like wrestling is his life. Yeah, like I don't think I don't think Kota Bushi even knows what COVID nineteen is. I think he has no idea what it is. Like I, I think if you ask the Bushi, like you know what coronavirus is, he would have no clue because he, all he does is like wrestle and probably work out. Seriously, so I was gonna. I was just having this silly joke. I was like, "Man, I'm not a man. I'm not planning on being a man anytime soon." But even I want to look like Kota Ibushi because, yeah. dang, he does look like some sort of Greek statue that you'd find somewhere. Uh, Zane Miller says this match was incredible. I love the apron work and the counters. Amazing chemistry, one hundred per. I agree. Uh, Matthew Makovsky also says that her Karana made my body her dude and the camera work. There was some really great camera work uh, overall on Wrestle Kingdom. There were some spots where I just thought that the camera made it look even that much more impressive. New Japan, New Japan's production and camera work is, is the gold standard to me uh, in pro wrestling. It's better than anything else. And, uh, and I'm not, I'm not like a, an expert when it comes to that, but I watch a lot of wrestling with my friends and I have friends who are experts like like Casey Lydon from MMAfighting.com who is a tremendous cinematographer, videographer, documentarian and and a director and he really knows production and video and and director work and uh, he he just he just gushes about New Japan's uh, you know directing and and its, and its production. So I I always err on the side of the experts. I'm not one of them when it comes to that kind of stuff, but if Casey says it's really great then I I trust Casey. Oh, trust me. I think I definitely believe him and agree with that opinion as well. Uh, so, Mark, I know that we're almost heading into that one hour, but let's go ahead and jump into that second show, man. Uh, we, it turns out we have lots to talk about, but I mean, it is, what, like eight hours of wrestling or more. <laughs> so, yeah. let's, you let's know. Plow, let's plow through. I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm not, I'm not asleep yet. Well, I'm still all right. We're gonna you. Plow through. First thoughts. What did you think of the four-way uh, with Bad Luck Fale, Chase Owens, Bushi, and Toriyanu? I mean, it was what it was fine. Yano, you know, wins the KOPW title again. It's I, I find Yano funny at times. Uh, this match didn't really do a whole lot for me. It was just there. I chuckled maybe a little bit when Yano won, but that was kind of that was pretty much it. You're like it was just a given mandatory chuckle. Uh, yeah. What did you think of the junior heavyweight tag team championship match? It was solid. I, I I enjoyed it for the most part. Certainly was not one of the best matches on the card um, on either night. It was probably toward the, the bottom of, of those matches, but it was still a solid match. Uh, I don't know what they're doing with Master Wato. I was a big fan of Hirai Kawato when he was a young lion. I thought he was primed for stardom. I thought he was going to be a huge junior baby face star in that, in that division. 
and uh, maybe he will get there, and and it likely probably will. But there's some growing pains right now. Some of it is him. Some of it is the booking. There were some botches he had that night. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think he'll be okay in the end. He's still really young. Taguchi is always entertaining. Um, I really, I really hope more for El Desperado in 2021. His match with Hiromu in the Best of Super Juniors final from a couple months ago was so good. One of the best matches in 2020. I thought. I thought that match was just phenomenal. Yeah, and just to add to this, I think that my favorite aspect of this match was really Taguchi. I love watching yeah. him work. He's very entertaining, and I love the balance in his matches. And I got to say that he was he was really what made this match interesting for me. Uh, but let's talk about the third match, and this was uh, Shingo versus Jeff Cobb. And, I mean, this was literally a lot of people's favorite match of the night and for very good reasoning. So, Marga, how did you feel about this one? I need a uh, I need a little need a little breather uh, after that match. That match was that match was so good. I mean, that match was. I think that might have been the best match of either night. I really do. I think that. I, Is that your number I, one? I, I'm sorry. Is that your number one pick for match I of the think, night? I think it is. I think it is. I'm not 100 percent sure. I have to watch it back again because again, it was late and I was tired. Well, I was tired the entire both events. I was tired, but that match was so freaking good and. I was just so happy for Jeff Cobb because this is a guy, I mean, as you know, Denise, you know, when he, he's done a lot of shows in the LA area. So I've been watching Jeff for several years in LA on the Indies. You know, I've seen Jeff Cobb at like a suburban fight, you know, uh, you know, in like a bar wrestling Darby Allen with like thumbtacks. Uh, so I've seen him from, you know, from years ago and now to see him in a singles match at the Tokyo dome at Wrestle Kingdom, and to have him deliver like that, I was just so happy for him because when he first came into New Japan, when he, when he first got that run in the G1 in 2019, it, it was a little bit lackluster. And I, I think a lot of people were disappointed because they saw him on the Indies in the United States and, and in ROH, and they thought, okay, this guy is going to be tremendous in New Japan. And for whatever reason, whether it be injuries or what have you, it didn't go his way in 2019. He came back in 2020. He had a really good G1. He had a good tag league. And they just absolutely tore the house down him and Shingo at the dome. That match was so good. I mean, I, I have a soft spot for Haas matches. I'm, I'm a big never open weight division fan. I love those kind of matches. I love Shingo Takagi, but that was the best match of Jeff Cobb's career. And it may have even been the best match of Shingo Takagi's career, which is saying a lot because he's had some tremendous matches in new Japan and dragon gate and, and, even in PWG, you know, the first time I think those guys ever met each other was in PWG in LA uh, in 2018 in Bola. So uh, the match was so good. I mean, some of the things that Jeff Cobb can do in the ring, I know I'm a little bit long winded, but I can, I can probably spend a whole hour on this match alone. You know, he had, he had Shingo up for in, in a body slam position and then just did a moonsault with this giant 240 pound man in his arms. I mean, who can do that? He was throwing Shingo around. It like was impressive. Uh, so good. So good. No, and I like the fact that you mentioned because you're like, oh, like, you know, LA Jeff Cobb has wrestled here. Like, did I? I don't think I've ever told you the story, you know? So I like to pretend that Jeff Cobb and I are BFFs because, you know, one time we were driving in LA traffic for about over, over an hour and a half. You know, just sharing a ride with Jeff Cobb was pretty awesome for me. One of my uh, highlights as a fan. So we got to talk a lot and he's a really cool dude like a really cool person so like i feel like i got this like inside connection with jeff cobb but no seriously though um i'm so happy for him because he's one of those guys that really buzzed his hump and has so he is so so impressive in the ring like it doesn't matter if you're watching him like on an indie show if you're watching like it really doesn't matter what show what platform what you're gonna expect from what show he goes out there and he just goes like nuts but seriously this match though with Shingo was really good because it was hard hitting it was you know just two guys just power 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 is really how i felt with this one and i think there was even a moment where shingo like lifted jeff cobb and i think in that moment i was like oh i want to like freeze frame this photo and i didn't but now i need to probably go back and freeze frame it because it looked really impressive i mean it looked impressive like i can't even uh stress that enough but no seriously this was a a really really good uh match for sure so good and uh, i have a i have a good story for you about jeff cobb as well for all you MMA fans out there, so so Jeff Cobb, 
I'm not sure where he's living right now, but for a long time he lived in Las Vegas and he trained at Syndicate MMA with, with Tom Lawler and a bunch of UFC fighters also train at Syndicate MMA under coach John Wood. And uh, John Wood told me that Jeff Cobb is the strongest man he has ever he's ever worked with. And that's saying a lot. John Wood once trained Francis Ngannou at wow. Syndicate MMA. So he said that Jeff Cobb is the strongest guy he's ever seen. And, and it, it, I mean, if you just watch that match against Shingo Takagi, the way that he was throwing that man around, it was like, I, I mean, I, I've never seen anyone handle Shingo in that way. I mean, that man is a freak of nature in terms of strength. I mean, he's a, he's a former Olympic wrestler, right? He was an Olympian for Guam. He lost, uh, yeah, yeah. he lost his first match in the Olympics to Yoel Romero. The, the yeah. UFC, the former UFC star, Yoel Romero, former UFC title challenger multiple times. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that guy is a legit athlete, legit powerhouse. And it's fun. And too, like I got a chance to interview Jeff Cobb and in there, he, you know, talks about the fact that New Japan is like the place where he wants mm -hmm. to go and work. So like now seeing him like, you know, since then, like be able to get these opportunities is really, really awesome. So honestly, thumbs up on this match for sure. Uh, this next match, Mark, I wasn't really looking forward to. And I got to say that it was the match that I would say uh, it, over it blew my, maybe not blew my expectations, but it came out or it was a, the result of it was a lot better than I expected. And it was Evil versus Sonata. On paper, I wasn't necessarily crazy about this one. I got to say I liked it. How did you feel about it? I actually disagree with you. I actually, uh, I, had a, I had a hard time getting into that match. I'm not sure if it was because it followed Shingo and Cobb or if it followed intermission, it was kind of in that, it was kind of in that dead zone, the same way that Tanahashi and great Okan was on night one, where it was like just after the intermission and you're kind of still half asleep at, you know, three in the morning. But so, so, and I like both guys a lot. I didn't, I was not a huge fan of, of evil's in ring performances in 2020, especially those matches against Naito where I thought he had a chance to really deliver and he, and he really didn't. And part of that was his fault. Part of that was the booking, uh, just the, oh, the overbooking, the interference, but this match is the story is that these guys were former tag team partners and evil turned on Los and Gobernables de Japón and, and Naito and Sonata. And now they're, now they're mortal enemies They're It's a grudge match. And the opening of the match was like, almost like a, a like comedy. Like there was the paradise lock. I mean, it, it didn't feel like these guys really like hate each other and they were going for each other's throats. So to me, it just kind of lacked that, intensity that i thought it should have had for what was supposedly a grudge match and i and i get that sonata his entire character is basically being stoic and not giving into his emotions but at some point that has to come through i look i didn't and i, I don't want to say it was a bad match it wasn't there really wasn't a bad match i mean maybe the, the rambo wasn't a great match but there, <laughs> as far as like the main matches there wasn't really a bad match but this one probably was the one that disappointed me the most Interesting. And for me, I completely fell opposite. And I do have to think that a lot of it is how we watch. You know, you mentioned the intermission. You mentioned coming off that Chingo, mm -hmm. uh jeff Cobb match. For me, I watched this completely different. I watched, you know, the day, you know, the day after. So I'm, you know, watching the morning, watching in the daytime. I don't have to, you know, sit through the intermission or anything like that. I can fast forward. That's perfectly fine for me. So I went into this expecting to kind of really not care about this match whatsoever. Because I just got to say, I'm not that really that big of a fan of evil. He's just there for me. He doesn't really, you know, ring my bell or anything like that. But I'm not really crazy about having all of, you know, the outside interferences. And I got to say, I actually liked uh, Dick Togo in this. I liked the interferences. I thought they were pretty funny. And we had a comment that I wanted to read from uh, Jobber JJ because I, I agree with this. He said, Evil Sonata was solid. Dick Togo took the greatest table spot of all time. I thought that table spot was hilarious. I don't know why, but I laughed during this. I no, liked it. it was, no, but I agree with you. It was hilarious. But it shouldn't have been hilarious. So this was not a comedy match. This was not Yano and Taguchi. This was supposed to be a grudge yes. match between two former tag team partners, and it just didn't hit that note for me. And I thought it was good, and I thought Dick Togo was good in that match. But See, so you were expecting something care. different, and I went in there yeah. not caring. So because I went in with such low expectations, that is why it worked out for me. You went in here thinking you were going to get what was supposed to happen based on the storyline of this, and you didn't get it. So, yeah, I completely agree with you in that sense, 100%. 
Oh, someone, Matthew Mikowski says, this was a match. I was checking Twitter the entire time and looking here and there. That's the worst. I hate when that happens. When a match just doesn't gravitate and you're just like, lottie, lottie, lottie. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Uh, let's go ahead and move into this match. You, I, This match, you were definitely paying attention. In fact, if you weren't paying attention, chances are you were going to miss something. And it was uh, the IWGB Junior he Heavyweight Championship, uh, Taiji Shimori versus Hiromo Takahashi. I uh, This was the match that I was hoping we were going to get for night two. And it was the match that we got. I mean, these are basically the top two, uh, you know, junior heavyweights in the in New Japan. And the fact that they, we actually got to see them and go at it, I thought this match was perfect. Uh, how did you feel about it? It was excellent. It was uh, it was a really, really great match. And I feel like this match, out of all the ones on both cards, may get overshadowed a bit by, you know, by the, the heavyweight title matches and by the Shingo Cobbs, but... This was a this was what a junior heavyweight title match was supposed to be, and I really want to give a, a ton of credit to Taiji Ishimori because I feel like, like others we've spoken about, like the Ospreys and the Jay Whites, he's really evolved his game over the years, and you know as he's gotten older, he can't rely as much on his athleticism, on his explosiveness, on some of the high flying. There's still elements of that in his game. And he, he's obviously a smaller guy, so that's kind of always going to be his style, at least somewhat. But th in 2020, in the match that he had against Hiromu at Jingu Stadium, and, it, and in this one again at the Dome, I thought that he really showed a different... He re he's really leaned into his the Bone Soldier persona, where he's just a ruthless emmer effort where he's going to go for the, he's going to, he's going to work on a body part. His technical game has evolved a lot. He's, he's more hard hitting than he was before. It, it feels like there's a lot more substance to who he is as an in-ring performer now. And I don't think this match was as good as their match in the best of the super juniors final in 2018. That match to me was one of the best matches of that year. That match was freaking amazing at Cork and hall. Wow. That was a great match, but this one was really, really, really good, and it, it, it showed that other side of, of Ishimori. And, of course, Hiromu was phenomenal. I mean, he's gonna, there's, he doesn't have a bad match. It's impossible. The guy's the guy ridiculous, and he's actually insane. That coat was unbelievable. I want to see, I wanna see yeah. your – I want to see, see a coat that you have, Denise, that matches Hiromu's entrance coat. Oh, no. Hiromu. My coats would be buried. They'd be the great Okan of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's leave poor Oka out of uh, out of our our. Just bury the poor guy. That's so sad. But, uh, but no, that match was that match was so good. And I I feel like it's gonna get lost. And I feel like when we're talking about matches of the year in in December twenty twenty one, we probably won't be mentioning that one. But that match was just a perfect match for for what it was. It did everything that it needed to do. It put Romu over as not just not just the best junior heavyweight right now in the world, but one of the best ever, you know, he's, he's getting almost into like, he's no one is liger territory, but he's in that zone where he's at kind of a, in rarefied air as far as a junior goes. And he's still got a long way to go. So uh, yeah, just, just a great match. And I really think that Ishimori is one of the few guys that could really keep up with Hiromu's speed. And the fact that he doesn't have to slow down or do anything differently, that just really adds to this. And I want to read a comment over from Jobber JJ because he says that ramp spot, I laugh. <laughs> I loved that spot. I mean, even though it didn't turn into something, you know, oh, so high impact. Just the fact of him like running down the ramp and then running through. Like, I thought that was great. Did you like that? I I did, but I felt like in real time, they didn't quite capture what happened. It almost looked like Karomu, like it didn't, it did it, you, you you couldn't see that Ishimori was actually putting an offensive like counter onto Romu to drop him. It just looked like he Romu missed or kind of caromed off of Ishimori. So I, I think that might've been, we talked about the, the directing and, and how good New Japan was. I think they may have missed <laughs> the proper angle for that one, yeah. but then on replay, I was like, okay, that was a really good spot, but it, it wasn't their fault. It was more of where, where the counter was placed at that time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I did want to add one more thing actually. And the thing that I wanted to add was that I just, I personally feel like this match, I know it's totally different from the Jeff Cobb Shingo match, but I actually ranked it higher than that match. And that's, that's, you know, I know it's a little, you know, crazy, but because they're, you know, really apples and oranges there, but that is how much I personally appreciated this match. And 
again, I love the Shingo Jeff Cobb match, but I had to rank this one a little higher. And that's why I, I, I know that it's going to be one of those matches that gets overlooked down the line. You know, it's barely the start of the year. So by the end of the year, I'm sure a lot of people will be like, probably have forgotten. But I really did like that match uh, that much. I have I have one criticism, and again, I thought it was great. My Bring the criticisms, Mark. We appreciate them. Yeah, my one my one criticism is I felt like the ending was slightly anticlimactic. I felt like they were the right before the ending, like the 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 last five minutes, they were starting to get into that like five star match territory, you know. Uh they were close to it because of the pacing and everything they had done before. And they were kind of right on the cusp of getting there, but then it kind of just ended. And then, and, and again, I'm, it's, it was, so it didn't hit its peak for you. To me, to me, it didn't hit its crescendo the way that I thought it, it could have. And, uh, and that's my one criticism, but again, it was, it was a great match. That's fair. And moving on to the main event of night two, main events, WI, double IWGB heavyweight and intercontinental championship match on the line, Jay White versus Kota Ibushi. I mean, this was this was a long match, but damn, it was good. How did you feel about all of this? How did you feel about the outcome, post-match, all of that stuff? I actually don't think I'm as high on this match as a lot of people on online are on reddit and and so on and so forth i don't think it was a bad match by any stretch i I thought it was a great match i thought it was you know one of the top you know three or four matches on wrestle kingdom probably i would say top three i don't want to i don't want to downgrade it too much but uh the the result was great and the finish was great but i just felt like there were times where it ran a little bit i don't even want to say it dragged but I do think that there that they could have tightened it up a little bit. I think there were, there, yeah, there were there were parts where you know you could lose two minutes here, you can lose two minutes there. The first twenty five minutes of the match was really just Jay White getting heat on Kota Ibushi, just just you know just beating him up and working on a body part, and that and that's fine, that's fine. But does it need to be twenty five minutes of, of that? I mean, that's a lot. That's a, that's an entire match worth of just Jay White getting heat, and and it didn't. I don't even want to say it felt like it was you know almost. 50 was it 48 minutes 48 minutes yeah i think it was around 40 40 ish minutes like 40, 45 yeah. somewhere around there yeah it was it was a long match uh i think it's the longest match in wrestle kingdom history so uh i thought they could have trimmed it a little bit there were some points where i thought it was a little bit self-indulgent you know where they were like sometimes epic matches just happen you know you, you know you just go out there and you put on a match and, and it's an epic match kind of like Cobb and shingo like that was like a 20 minute match but it ended up, it was epic for different reasons. This one, it felt a little bit forced, like a little bit like they were trying to force an epic on you. Like if we go long, then it'll trick people into thinking that it was a lot better than it was. And, and, and again, I don't want to, I thought it was a great match. Like I thought it was really, really, really great match. And I enjoyed it a lot, but I just thought that there were parts that, and I, and I do think that things were happened for a reason and they, and they paced it the way they did for a reason. And I do think Jay White was brilliant. I thought, I thought it was one of his best matches, if not his best match. It was, it was, in some ways, it was a better performance in this match than he had in his G1 final match in 2019 with Ibushi, which was also a very good match. But I thought Jay White was even better in this match than, than he was in that match as a heel. And just the things we spoke about at the beginning of the show, his mannerisms and, and just every, every little thing, every tiny thing he does down to the end of the match, after the match, when he was grabbing for the belts, you know, where that, that, he, that he was so close to getting, but he couldn't get. But I just thought it could have been it could have been just dialed back just a little bit and been just as effective. So the 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 it's kind of it's kind of the opposite criticism that I had at uh, uh, for Hiromu and Ishimori, where that could have gone maybe a little bit longer and hit like a little bit of, a, of another gear. This one probably could have. There were some finishes there that could have happened earlier that would have made just as much sense and would have been as, as good, if not better, of a match. Just my opinion. I know a lot of people love that match. I loved it too. Don't get me wrong. Bushi won. <laughs> It was the right thing to do. He's God with a capital G, all that stuff. It's all great. I, I enjoyed it immensely. I just thought that there were some points that were a little bit self-indulgent. I, You know what? I got to say, I don't necessarily hate with that. I hate your opinion on there because I actually do think it was very valid. Uh, I agree with you in the sense of where, you know, you could have taken some of that time from that match onto, you know, the Ishimori match. And, you know, like you said, it would have gotten to that next level that you were, you know, that you know that they can get to. 
So I do think so that they could have refined it a lot more because even like when they finally got to the moment where, you know, Kota Ibushi was really, really upset. That's when I kind of felt like, okay, we're finally going somewhere with this match. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I think for me, it felt more like a journey where it's like, okay, we're starting off at this point and now we're finally getting to this point where it's this, you know, who knows this whirlwind of events and what is going to happen here. Uh, you finally got booed, Mark. You were being loved by the people. Now, Jason PS3 says, boo, Mark, LOL. Uh, Matthew Makovsky says, this match, this is why I love pro wrestling. Emotional storytelling at its finest. I love this match so much. I can't put it into words to be continued. Uh, Zane Miller says, length of the match didn't bother me. Jay White continues to impress me as the best heel. And Coda putting together another five-star performance was unbelievable just well. Jobber JJ says, Ibushi versus Jay White was my match of Wrestle Kingdom. Loved it so much. The crowd clapping. You could feel it in Ibushi that he couldn't quit. Match time was 48. You know, I you know, there's one of, now that he says this, Jobber JJ, can you tell, Mark, when there's like this shift in Kota Ibushi's mind? Like you can kind of see, like read his thoughts where you can finally see where he's like, oh, you guys think I'm here, but I'm just going to go ahead and ramp it up to that next level. I feel like you can see that shift in his head. Yeah, Murder Ibushi comes out. He just becomes just a, just a killer uh, where he just like throws open fists and he starts just beating the hell out of people. My favorite Murder Ibushi moment in recent years was against uh, Ishii from the 2018 G1 where he just absolutely went to t I mean, he just was throwing uh, closed fists at like Ibushi, at uh, Ishii's throat in that match. It was like, what the hell is going on here? Like that guy is out of his mind. The thing about Ibushi that I, that I always find interesting is that he's such a unique guy. And I have a hard time, and this I mean this is a compliment, separating like the man from the character. I don't really know where like the actual real guy starts and the character Kota Ibushi ends. I think they're kind of one and the same. I think he kind of lives it in, in a way. He uh, probably so, does. So like you never so in, in that way, he's very unpredictable because like he just may haul, you know, this guy's like a K1 caliber kickboxer. He may just, just haul off and kick somebody in the face for real. Like you don't know about this guy. He's a little bit out, you know, he's a little Mysterious, bit serious, kind of. And he, and he like he gets like against Sonata in the G one final. Like he he definitely got like his uh he got like uh, knocked a little bit loopy in that match. I thought he might have been concussed. And there were some like wonky moments in that match. And that happened also in the Golden Lovers versus Young Bucks match uh, from from uh, Long Beach from a few years oh, ago. Yeah. And and, and that you never know when that's gonna happen either. So you never know when the guy's just gonna haul off and like actually do something really stiff. Or he may just like you know hit his head on something and just be loopy the rest of the match. You just never know with this guy. But he's great. <laughs> I mean, he's great. And then. He absolutely deserved this moment. And, uh, you know, someone at the caliber of Kota Bushi, like for American wrestling fans, when you're at the level that he's been for as long as he's been there, the level of talent, the level of stardom, he would have been in, in, in the United States, he would have been the champion like, you know, five years ago. But in New Japan, there is a pecking order and there are they, they just do things differently. There are much longer title reigns. Not everyone gets the title. There's no such thing as like, extra special. There's no such there's no such thing as like a gift title reign in New Japan Pro Wrestling. You know, that's why a guy like Goto, bless his heart, is never gonna get the IWGP heavyweight title. Neither is Tom here Ishii, as much as I love both those guys. And explain evil Mark Ramondi. I well, I mean, I can't explain. I can't that I cannot explain. <laughs> the one thing I can say about, about evil in 2020 is that it was 2020. And it, yeah. and it was a pandemic, and who the hell knows what the initial plan was for. Maybe that was the plan, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it would have been better, you know, if, if things were, were a little bit more normal. I have no idea. But the point I'm trying to make about Ibushi is that he's been a star for so long. This was his time. He's 38 years old. He's, he's not a spring chicken anymore. As, I mean, he looks like $10 million, but he's, old, he's an older guy. He's, toward, he's closer to the end of his career than the beginning of his career. Although knowing him, he may wrestle like he's, like he's 100 because he's freaking Kota Ibushi. But at some point, you have to pull the trigger. And you can make the argument that Gato did not pull the trigger on Naito fast enough because Naito was – as popular as anyone in New Japan for years, and they never gave him the big run with the belt. And this is the right time for Bushi. It may be, you can say it's a little bit late, but it definitely feels like it's in that in that time period where he's at the height of his of his powers, even though he's a little bit older. Uh, the guy is uh, the guy is a, a marvel. He really is. And we have a couple of comments that I want to get into. Uh, Keeve Kev says the match was epic. Zane Miller says when Coda stops selling, I immediately <laughs> on my feet. I think that's kind of like the go-to, right? And yeah. we actually have a question for you. Matthew wants to know, a uh, question directed towards Mark. As a not huge New Japan fan, since I absolutely love this match, would I love Okada versus Ibushi from last year? 
Yes, yes, that match was amazing. I would I would say that match was probably better than anything on these two nights. That match was so good. And the, the difference, Matthew, if, you, if you're not a big New Japan fan, is that last year there was like almost 50,000 people at the Tokyo Dome cheering and yelling, not, not staying quiet and only clapping at certain periods of time. It was a different atmosphere. And I was there. It was amazing. That match was incredible. I love it. I love your passion, Mark. It really, really shows. Uh, seriously, though, and one of the parts that I liked about this match, too, that I want to make sure to add is that when Jay was slamming uh, Ibushi back and forth from the ring to the to the barricade like and just basically telling him like f you dude i love that spot and i think that's one of the things where you know we were talking about jay white and how he brings in these little things that he does into the match this is one of those little things that he kind of did to really just sell you know what he was doing i love this incorporation of this and i also liked when uh Jay White laid down and basically played the fact that he was done, you know, hey, just pin me, pin me. But Kota Ibushi did not fall for that. I loved all of those little things that Jay White did in this match. To me, the best spot of the entire match was when Ibushi was in murder mode and Jay White just laid down and baited Ibushi to beat him up and he, and he was covering up. And then Ibushi pushed Red Shoes, the referee, away. So Jay White basically outsmart. He figured out a way to outsmart Murder Ibushi. He kind of used his aggression against him, and I thought that was a brilliant touch. But there were other points in the match where, you know, there was one. There was one point late in the match where they went to the outside, and Jay White was like landing forearms on like on the entrance ramp, and that just felt kind of superfluous to me. That felt, that felt like it didn't need to be there. That that those are parts that could have been cut out. But I don't want to. I don't want to crop on this match too much. I mean, I, I thought it was really really great. Some of it is is just kind of me. Uh, you know, niggling over quibbles, as they say, kind of just like nitpicking. But, uh, but I mean, it was it was a very, very, very good match. Well, I'm sure you know, like after seeing so many matches and seeing what you know the caliber of matches that you see in New Japan, you start to you know people have really raised the bar, and that's just mm -hmm. that's just fact. There, honestly, really, really is just fact. Uh, but there we guys go. That is our show. Um, honestly, Mark, I want to thank you so much for coming on here and talking about. All of this here with me today it was really awesome to get into your head, talk about New Japan, etc. <laughs> I think the people liked you, except for that one boo that you got. <laughs> but no, seriously, Mark, I really, really thank you. And uh, do you have any closing thoughts, anything you want to add, anything you want to touch on that maybe you felt like you didn't get to say? No, I mean, thank you for having me. I, I really, really love Japanese pro wrestling and pro wrestling in general, but especially New Japan. I think that it is it is at the top of my at least, you know, favorite list for, for what I enjoy the most. And uh, don't forget, New Year Dash is is later on tonight. I can't stay up for this one, Denise. I can't do it. Two nights is enough. You got to sleep, one man. At, this one starts at 1.30 a.m. I just can't pull this one off. I'm sorry, but I'll watch it. Try to watch it spoiler free on Wednesday morning. And there's a lot of things that can develop. Jay White's promo where he basically said he's, he's quitting. This is like his last, you know, show at New Japan. Kota Bushi wants the, the, uh, the heavyweight and the intercontinental title to be unified as one, as one belt. There's going to be a lot of developments at New Year Dash, which is always one of the most fun shows of the year. Uh, so I definitely, for people like Matthew Makovsky, who commented that they're not big New Japan fans, this is another must-see because New, New Year Dash will set up the storyline for the next, you know, two or three months down, down the road. So definitely watch that tomorrow morning. I wouldn't recommend watching it overnight. Don't be crazy. I've, I've, I've done that twice. I don't recommend it. Uh, I'm probably going to just crash like on my keyboard as soon as this, this show is over, Denise. Um, but uh, no, it was a great time. Let's do this again. Seriously, no, let's do this again. Uh, Matthew wants to close it out by saying, we love Mark. Thank you, Denise, for doing this. I'll see you tomorrow after, after. oh my God, New Year's Eve. Well, yeah, don't forget to check out my show on F4W Online. Speak now, pro wrestling. We will be talking about New Year's Evil and all of that stuff. Joseph Boza says, cool, Denise, had on Mark before the adventures began for Connor Week over in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. I was going to say Abu Dhabi. <laughs> um, uh, Jabber JJ says, thank you, Denise and Mark, for a great review of Wrestle Kingdom. I'm watching New Year's Dash. Uh, perfect time for me. Uh, for me 9 30 a.m nice and some guy says thank you guys so much for a great review and matthew mccoskey says how nine staying up to 1 30 a.m mark um tell the people where they can follow you on social media yeah uh m-a-r-c underscore r-a-i-m-o-n-d-i that's on twitter and uh it's mark ray Mundy mma on instagram and you mentioned conor mcgregor in that comment i do have an interview up right now on espn.com with conor mcgregor's nutritionist 
Tristan Kennedy. It was a really great interview, a lot of insight into how Conor McGregor is fueling himself ahead of UFC 257 against uh, Dustin Poirier. So check that out, please, on ESPN.com. Please check that out, guys. Follow Mark Ramondi on Twitter and all the social media handles. I did put his Twitter link in the description box. So you guys can just go ahead and click on there and get to his page. And, oh, we have a, a super chat from Chris Ledeck. He says, hey. happy new year to you both. Thank you so much, Chris, for sending in a super chat to close out the show. Uh, guys, I'll see you guys here tomorrow at underscore Denise Salcedo, Twitter and Instagram. Do not forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more stuff like this. And until next time, we'll see you guys.